right, good morning. Tell you what, I love this series. So when you're in seminary and you're training to be a pastor preacher type, these are the kind of the kind of series that you like think about and you're like, man, this is what we're gonna do all the time. We're gonna talk about theology proper, we're gonna talk about qualities of God all the time, and we won't worry about the other stuff. So I'm pumped. This has been a great series. And today specifically, we're talking about God's holiness. Now, when we talk about God's holiness, I think a lot of us have a lot of trepidation, a lot of fear, a lot of concern, because we recognize that God's holiness is kind of the quality about him uh, that, that we feel a little uncomfortable with. We, we don't know that we can really define it. Uh, we we kind of live in this tension between God uh, wanting us to be close to him, and he says that he loves us, but at the same time, uh, we read in the Bible that like people do things that violates God, God's holiness, and he winds up, you know, they wind up dead. So we're in this sort of confusing place with God's holiness. So what I want us to do today uh, as we look at Isaiah 6 is to talk about this tension that we live in between the joy of being near God and also the terrifying uh, nature of God. And, and what I was thinking about as I was working through it this week uh, was it reminded me of my time in the army because the army uh, is a very uh, stratified society, right? So you have rank and wherever you are in the rank, that's kind of where you are in the pecking order. Your identity can be found based on like where, what, what emblems are on you. And so uh, when I was in the army in 2009, uh, I was working at Fort Hood uh, just prior to the shooting that happened there that year. And uh, I was uh, working with a mobilization brigade. Basically our job was to get units that were going overseas to Iraq and Afghanistan, reserve units, getting them ready uh, to be deployed. And so I was a chaplain, chaplain candidate at the time. And uh, I was, we would go down to the airport when these units would fly out and we would kind of pray with them or we would just see them off because we'd work with them for so long. And before uh, this happened, I think this was later in the evening, I had some free time and I thought, well, I need to get a haircut because my, my hair was getting uh, a little shaggy uh, by my army standards, not by like anybody else's standards. Uh, and so I went in and I had heard people talk about this thing called a high and tight. I did not know what a high and tight was, but I said I wanted one. If you don't know what a high and tight is, uh, basically it's like bald here. And then there's like this strip of hair. It's basically like a wider mohawk. And that's what they gave me. And my commanding officer, Colonel Hicks, he had a high and tight as well. So I show up, and of course the officers all start making fun of me because of my new haircut. I'm a lowly lieutenant. I'm easy prey. And I walked in, and me trying to be fun and engaging with the people around me, I said, well, I asked for the Colonel Hicks, and this is what they gave me. The laughter stopped. It ceased. Somebody was nice enough to pull me aside and say, Chaplain, you can't make fun of the commanding officer's haircut. I had forgotten that he was in a different level than I was. I had treated him as familiar. And this is something that we're afraid to do with God. We're, we're afraid to treat him as common, which we should be afraid to do that. We should be cautious in how we respect him and admire him. But uh, we, we also want to be close to him. Colonel Hicks was a nice guy. I wanted to be around him. I wanted to learn from him. And so there's this tension that we live in. And I think when it comes to God, I want us to see today four things that God's holiness actually does that allows us to approach him and sort of live in this tension that we have. And the first one is God's holiness supersedes. Now, I don't mean like it takes the place of. It's central to who he is. It's central to his character. Look at chapter 6, verse 1 of Isaiah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. These are angels. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face. With two he covered his feet. And with two he flew. And one called to the another and said, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. <clears throat> Now, there are a couple of uh, analogies that are kind of subtle between uh, Uzziah the king and God. So Uzziah was a fairly decent king, good guy, uh, made one big mistake in his life, went into the temple, offered incense uh, to God in a way that wasn't appropriate, and God struck him with leprosy because he treated God as common. He kind of violated God's holiness. So for the last 11 years of his life, Uzziah, not Isaiah, but Uzziah had leprosy. This was a terminal illness. He would die with it, and that creates instability and insecurity, right? When the king uh, is, it might die at any moment, there's fear, there's trepidation there. At the same time, uh, when you have leprosy uh, in, in uh, Judaism, uh, that's considered unclean in the Old Testament world. And so he couldn't go to the temple and worship anymore. So the king is supposed to be one of these primary worship leaders, and now he can't lead effectively in worship. More instability. At the same time, 
the kingdom of, As- of Assyria, brutal, brutal empire, was rising up, and people were trying to figure out what in the world are we going to do with Assyria? More instability. And then lastly, Uzziah then dies. And in that year, Isaiah has this vision, and you see the comparisons taking place. One, who's on a throne? It's not Uzziah, it's God. God's on the throne. That's what Isaiah sees. And where is God's throne placed? It's in the temple where Uzziah couldn't go anymore. And Isaiah sees all this stability happening. And then uh, Isaiah sees that God is high and lifted up. Well, where's Uzziah? Uzziah is low and in the ground where God is high and lifted up. And then lastly, Uzziah is not attended by anybody, but God is attended by these things called seraphim, which literally translated is burning ones. They're, they're basically on fire uh, for God. You've probably heard that expression. They literally are on fire for God um, in the worship of the Lord. And these burning ones have something to say. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of your glory. In our language, in English, uh, if you want to make something the most that it can be, a superlative, you typically add an EST to the end of it, right? So if somebody is the tallest person in the room, we say they are the tallest, EST. Or if they're the biggest, the biggest, the smallest, the smallest. In Hebrew, they didn't do that. In Hebrew, you just repeat the adjective. So if somebody's the tallest person in the room, they're tall, tall. Somebody's the shortest person in the room, they're short, short. Right? Imagine going through your life, all, your whole life being short, short. Hey, they're short, short. Just rough. So when the angels are singing, they're saying that God is the most holy person ever. But notice what they do. They don't repeat it twice. They repeat it a third time. Holy, holy, holy. This is to say that God is holy in another category. He's categorically different than anyone or anything else in all of existence. His holiness sets him apart. There are some things that are made holy. God is holy. And we have a problem with this because we don't really know what holiness is. It's a four-letter word that we use to describe God as being other than. It's really how we use it. And we like to think of God's holiness as just another characteristic of who he is, and that's not the case. God's holiness infuses the other characteristics of God. It's the harmony that's produced by God's other characteristics. In fact, if God's characteristics, and this isn't a perfect analogy, but we'll go with it. If God's other characteristics, his power, his strength, his omniscience, uh, his wisdom, his mercy, his love, if they're all individual instruments, in a symphony orchestra. The symphony that's played, the music that's produced would be God's holiness. But don't lose sight of the fact that God's holiness is the very reason for their existence. So the reason why the instruments exist in the first place is to produce music. So God's holiness is paramount. It's central. It's it's, it's the core of his being and God is completely unified. So he's not divided up into separate parts. So when we talk about God's love, we say God's love is holy. Talk about God's wrath. God's wrath is holy. When we talk about his mercy, it's holy. You wouldn't flip that around. You wouldn't say that God has merciful holiness. It doesn't make sense. You wouldn't say that God has loving holiness. It doesn't make sense. God's holiness infuses every part of his being. So what is holiness? Thomas Oden says this, to say that God is holy is nothing other than to say that God is perfect in goodness, both in God's essential nature, so who he is, and in every act or energy, what he does, or operation that proceeds out of that nature. He is perfect in goodness. He cannot be imperfect. He cannot do anything wrong. He can't make a mistake. And his qualities are all perfect. So think of it like gold being refined, like the purest gold it can be. This is what God, God's, God's love is the purest love that can possibly be conceived. In fact, we can't even get our heads around it. And while our reaction to God's holiness is sometimes like, whoa, that's, that's a little, that's intense. As you'll see Isaiah do in just a couple minutes. If you remove God's holiness from his characteristics, there's problems created. If God were all powerful, but he wasn't holy, he'd be abusive. He'd be a tyrant. If God were all knowing, but not holy, he would be manipulative. He'd be capricious, he'd be petty. If God were all loving but not holy, he'd be a pushover, like a parent that just gives ice cream to the kids whenever they want it. Kids are like, that sounds good to me. If God were wrathful but not holy, he would just destroy everything and then maybe recreate it to destroy it all over again. 
If God were merciful but not holy, injustice would run rampant. If God were just but not holy, we'd never be able to please him. So yes, God's holiness is intimidating, absolutely. But it is the thing about him that is so central about him and so beautiful about him that it should give us pause to think and consider about who he is. If I had stopped to consider for half a second that my commanding officer outranked me by about three, four levels, I would not have made fun of his haircut. So what I want us to do before we proceed any further is to just stop in the silence and the stillness, if you can be silent and still at home, and just contemplate the fact that God is perfect in goodness. He has no flaws. And stop and think for a second. Now, as you were thinking, you probably thought, if God is perfect and I'm not, what does that mean for me? Well, it's a good question. God's holiness separates. It separates. He separates him from us. Look at verse 4. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called, and the house was filled with smoke. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. This is Isaiah speaking. And everything about Isaiah's environment and everything about what Isaiah says is pointing you to the fact, the reader, that he doesn't belong there. So the thresholds of the doorway shakes. Okay, so if, you, if the doorways started shaking in this room or where you're at, you wouldn't want to go through that doorway, right? It's a barrier. Isaiah is excluded from entering into and engaging with the worship of God. What's more, is the room fills with smoke. He can't see God. God is obscured from his view. And then he says, I am in trouble. I shouldn't be here. If God is perfect, it means that God is morally perfect. He never does anything wrong. He has no sin. He commits no sin. He never does anything wrong. Isaiah, on the other hand, being human, is flawed. We all carry this condition called sin. It's with us. It it, it infects everything we do. It infects everything we think or say. It impairs many of our, all of our capacities. And Isaiah recognizes that there's a, a, a chasm between him and God and God's worship. And Isaiah blurts out, I have said some really stupid things in my life. I can identify with that. And I have been around people who have said things that are really, really, really awful as well. And what's more is I've been okay with it. I haven't separated myself from it. Now, you might think this is minor, because, wow, Isaiah, you're in the presence of a holy God, and that's the thing you come up with to confess? Like, all of us think we'd get in the presence of a holy God, and, like, our deepest, darkest shame would be, like, put on display. But Isaiah runs to his lips, and I think there's two reasons for this. One, Jesus tells us later on in the Gospels that out of the heart, the mouth speaks. So by confessing he has unclean lips, he's saying, my heart's not right. There's something wrong here, and I know it because of what comes out here. The second thing he does is when he says, I'm lost, The Hebrew there actually means like I'm ruined or I'm silent. And one commentator I read this week said that that can mean that Isaiah is wanting to participate in worship, but he recognizes that he can't. And so all he can do is confess the the, the issue in his life, the, the the unworthiness that he has to participate in worship. And this is often how we feel when we really consider and approach God. Think about if you have sin in your life, if you've just done something that you're ashamed of, you don't feel like you can go to God. We have this trepidation when we think of God's holiness. When you think about how perfect he is and how flawed you are, it creates a gap. You can't help but recoil. Surely he won't want anything to do with me. I mean, if you really think about God's moral perfection, he never does anything wrong, you really can't get your head around it. We literally cannot conceive of somebody that never does anything wrong. And if we do, we're kind of annoyed with it, right? Mr. and Miss Perfect over there. Our minds and souls are so fractured by sin that we honestly cannot come up with someone who does everything right in the short and long term. Louis Burkhoff says this. He's another theologian 
Holiness is part of the non-rational God, which cannot be thought of conceptually. What he means there is the non-rational God being you can't get your head around it. You can't come up with the concept for it. And which includes such ideas as absolute unapproachability and absolute overpoweringness or awful majesty. The E is supposed to be there. It means he's full of awe. It awakens in a person a sense of absolute nothingness, a creature consciousness or creature feeling leading to absolute self-abasement. What this means is when you genuinely consider how perfect and how other than God is, how holy, holy, holy God is, it puts you on a pathway of realizing that you are not that. And you become very self-conscious of the fact that you are flawed to the point where if you run it out long enough, it leads to self-abasement, which basically is what Isaiah does. Woe is me. I've got no hope. I deserve death. I deserve destruction. And much like Isaiah, that impulse that we have is not wrong. We talk a lot about grace here at Park Cities. It's my favorite thing about this place. And we will talk about grace here in a little bit because it's key to this, this problem that we're in. But we cannot run to grace at the expense of the holiness and respect that God deserves, right? Now, what do I mean by that? God's holiness is something that we have to take into account as we engage with him. We cannot treat him as common. To be holy means to be set apart, to be other than, to be perfect, right? This is why in the Old Testament, when you read through the Bible, you see stuff get set apart to God. You see uh, cities get devoted to destruction because they're made holy. You see uh, uh, animals get set apart. You see uh, instruments, pots, plow heart, plow, plows, things like that, all sorts of stuff get set apart to God. It's because they're being sanctified. They're being set apart for holiness, not common use, right? And you see people in the Old Testament when, when they're killed because they violated Sabbath or they're killed because they took something that was devoted to God, it's because they treated God as common, right? Now, we don't do that now, which is good. But God's place, his holiness, makes him other than it separates him from us. My, commanders, my commanding officer's rank separated him from me. He was a colonel. I was a lowly lieutenant. And if you've ever been in the army, you know nobody knows less in the army than the lieutenant. You cannot approach God in this sense of uh, familiarity. You're not a peer with God. You're not gonna make him your equal. You're not ever gonna earn God's respect. You're never gonna prove yourself to God. So we need to operate, again, not as if we're walking on eggshells, but we do need to operate with the question, how can I show God respect? How can I give him preeminence in my life? I've got a couple ideas here. One, growing in grace and holiness. Now, if you're a believer, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is for you, okay? If you're not a believer, we're gonna get to you in just one second, okay? But growing in grace and holiness means leading an examined life. Being like Isaiah, looking at your life and saying, I am a person that has done this, that lives amongst the people that does this, and I've been okay with it. And I'm not going to do that anymore. A lot of times we just are comfortable with the way we, oh, that's just culturally acceptable, so we go along with it. What does scripture say? What is God leading us to do? I need to grow, and what do I watch? What do I think about? What do I listen to? Are those things growing me in holiness, or... Are they taking away from that? What do you think about? If out of the heart and the mouth speaks, what do you talk about? What you speak about probably is a good indication of what's going on inside of you. Do you talk a lot about money? Is that all you think about? Greed is probably an issue for you. It's probably an issue for a lot of us, more than we think. Do you talk about yourself a lot? Pride is an issue. So we need to grow in holiness. Lead an examined life. Secondly, give God precedence in your life. There's a series of Psalms in the Old Testament, in the book of Psalms. Uh, it's the low 100s, if you want to know where they're at. Uh, they're called pilgrim psalms. And basically, they're songs that people would sing on their way up to Jerusalem to do sacrifice for festivals like uh, Passover or the Feast of Booths. And what it means is, what it tells us is that the worship service didn't start when they got to the temple. The worship service started when they were at home and they're walking out the door on their way. And they would sing these songs along the way. Let me ask you, how do you prepare? How do we prepare for worship? Does it take two or three songs when I get in the room here or when I start turning on the TV to get me in the mood to start thinking about paying attention to worship? 
Or are you doing the pre-work beforehand? Like a pilgrim coming up on a journey, on a pilgrim's journey to worship together. What is the process of worship like for you? Is it considered? Is it thought through? Or do you just give God the leftovers? I understand getting out on Sunday morning is difficult. I have kids too. But what are we doing to prepare ourselves to engage with a holy God? Now, you might sit there and say to yourself, well, Travis, you just said I'm not ever going to earn God's respect and I'm not really gonna be on par with him. You said a bunch of stuff like that. Uh, Why would I bother giving him respect when I'm not gonna be able to earn that from him? Well, there's good news. God's holiness also saves. It separates, but it also saves. Look at verse six. Then one of the seraphim, one of the burning ones, flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. This is so loving and so compassionate on the part of God. Now, some of you are probably sitting there being like, the dude just touched his lips to a burning hot coal. That does not sound compassionate. Fair enough. But look at what God does. So God is being worshiped by these burning ones, these heavenly beings. He takes from his worship. We interrupt this worship so that Isaiah can join in. The seraphim flies to Isaiah, meets his need. So God notices him, one, the eternal God notices, and God does something for him. The second thing he does is he doesn't just say, oh, it's okay, don't worry about it. Ah, everybody's got unclean lips, it's not a big deal, Isaiah. No, what does he do? He takes a burning coal, the seraphim takes a burning coal from the altar and uses it to purify Isaiah. Now, now, fire is not purifying typically in the Old Testament. Usually it's water that's purifying and there's nothing special about a coal. What makes this special is where the coal comes from. It comes from the altar, the altar in the temple. You know what happens on the altar in the temple? Sacrifices are made. Burnt offerings are made to God. The sacrifices of atonement are made to God. So the people of Israel have sin. They go and they sacrifice, and that's what allows them to worship. It closes the barrier of separation. And so he has this burning hot coal, and where does he touch it? To his lips. Yeah, we all agree. Isaiah probably has some some issues in his life, right? Probably some, some things going on beyond just having unclean lips. But God hears the confession and he addresses it. And then he speaks to him and says, your guilt's taken away. You know what's key here? God doesn't just forgive Isaiah. He makes sure that he knows that he's allowed in. He goes through the work, through the effort to be like, Isaiah, I've got you taken care of. You're okay. You're forgiven. You can join in. And if you want to fast forward a little bit to the New Testament, Jesus Christ is our burning coal pressed against our hearts that we might be able to enter into the presence of God and know that we're okay there, that we're safe there. Yes, God is holy and other than, but his burning glory is not going to consume us because we have been cleansed and purified by the blood of Jesus Christ. Yeah, there's a big separation. But God's holiness is, God's love rather, is holy. And because his love is holy, it moves him to send his son to die for us, to make us right with him, so that we can engage with him, so that we can be where we're supposed to be followers and worshipers of God himself. He takes care of Isaiah here. And what's great about this is God maintains his holiness. He didn't just let it go. He just wave it aside. That, that would be terrible. That would make God unjust. But because God pours out his wrath, his holy wrath on his own son rather than us, we're made right with him. Now, what do we do with this? What do we do with this? Well, if you're not a believer, if you're not a follower of God, You need to join in with Isaiah here, confessing, saying, okay, God, you are perfect. I believe that you're perfect. I'm accepting the fact that you're perfect, and I am not. And I can't help but think that does create some kind of a distance, some kind of a barrier, and there's some way to overcome that. Now, one of the ways that people typically try to overcome this is by being a good person, right? I'm going to do the right things. Isaiah was a prophet of God, by all accounts, a good man. In fact, we we believe, according to church tradition, that he was sawed in half because of his ministry for God. He was persecuted and killed. So if you're going to go for goodness, 
You're gonna have to top that because Isaiah comes before the Lord and says, I'm in trouble. I don't belong here. I'm still unworthy to be here. So I've got a, a sneaking suspicion that getting by on your own works, your own effort isn't going to work for you. If I can just counsel you in that way. So there has to be something else. And it's Jesus Christ. It's letting his work stand in for us. Saying, I am unworthy, but he's not. And I want to be with him. And you know what Jesus says? Come on. Come on. And I think some of us get a little nervous around Jesus. Because we get this in our mindset that Jesus, because he's perfect, wouldn't want to be around any of us, right? And, and it'd kind of be like walking on eggshells with Jesus, Right? Think about the people that hang around with Jesus. Think about the people that, that spend time with him. What about kids? Do kids like to be around intimidating, scary people? No. They like to be around fun and engaging people, nice people. Got a sneaking suspicion Jesus was probably a great guy to be around. Look at his disciples. He tells his disciples, hey, I've got to go away and you're not going to see me anymore. Now, if I'm around people that make me walk on eggshells that I don't want to be around, when they tell me they're going to go away, you know what I do? Secretly inside, I'm like, yay. I will never tell you if you're one of those people, by the way. Poker face, totally. Jesus, when he tells them that, they are grieved. They're upset. They don't want him to go. You know what? I think, Jesus, you would be surprised at how much you would enjoy being around the Lord and not remotely feeling like you had to walk on eggshells around him. Come to him, confess, get to know him. The other thing I would say, if you are a believer, you need to be acknowledging where you're at. We need to grow in holiness, yes, but we also need to acknowledge the fact that none of us are where we want to be in our relationship with the Lord and that we have a long way to go. And you're never going to grow if you don't admit to the fact that like, man, I've, I've got some work to do. And Lord Jesus, you've got work to do in me. You know what was great about my, my, my commanding officer after I made that joke about him having, uh, I guess, bad hair? He treated me like normal. He forgave me. It was not a problem. It was really neat. God's holiness rescues us. But the cool thing about it is it doesn't just keep us uh, in this state where we sit around and just sing kumbaya with our, with, with, holding hands. I mean, there's a part of that, I think. Maybe not the kumbaya. But God's holiness does one more thing. It sends us out. It sends us out. Look at verse eight. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? And then I said, here I am, send me. So Isaiah has gone from, woe is me, I'm gonna die, to I would like to work for you. Here's my resume. Woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. That guy wants to work for you. So not the greatest interview ever, but we're on the move. This is how you know that Isaiah is actually believing the fact that he's been forgiven. Because now, rather than being terrified, he just wants to be like, yeah, send me. I want to go and work for you, God. God's holiness is not a holiness where we all just sit around and, and just view, be in awe of it. There's a part of it that's like that, yeah. But God's holiness is ascending holiness. It sends us out. If you look at the Mount of Transfiguration, Jesus goes up on a mountain with three of his disciples and he reveals to them who he really is. He reveals all of his glory and Peter, good old Peter, is like, hey, let's build some houses and let's just stay here. This is great. And Jesus is like, no, nah, let's go back down the mountain. We got some work to do. God's holiness sends us out to proclaim to the rest of the world what God's holiness looks like and invite other people into relationship with God. So Thomas Oden has three ideas about how we can demonstrate God's holiness to the rest of the world. One, don't put boundaries on your goodness. Matthew 5, 48 says, be holy as your heavenly father is holy. God's holiness is central to who he is and it has no limits. I think oftentimes when we think about our holiness, we think about our righteousness, we think about our good behavior, we think like, oh, I don't wanna be holier than thou. I don't wanna be one of those weird Christians, okay? You believe literally that a man died and then came back to life and that you get to have a relationship with God because of it, that's weird. You're already weird if you're a Christian. Just go ahead and embrace that. Give that a big old hug. We don't need to worry about that. We need to not let our holiness be limited. Not letting God, what God's doing in our life be limited. 
We have prejudices. We have things we've been raised in, things that we've learned that we need to let go of and reject in favor of growing in the goodness and plan of God in our life. There's also prayer. Prayer is a way that we can show the world God's holiness. So we can do it in our behavior. We can also do it in prayer. Uh, Jesus teaches his disciples to pray. And he says, our father who's in heaven, hallowed be thy name. He says, holy is your name. That's a confession and a prayer. It's a confession saying, God, your name is holy. But it's also a prayer that God would make his name holy in the world. Meaning that when people use God's name inappropriately, by our actions, we, we, we insert it, we use it as a swear word, we do all sorts of things terrible with God's name. We're defiling it. And what, the pers- what, what Jesus is saying we should pray is that God would make his name holy, meaning that you would rescue and redeem people so that they stop doing that. That your name would be sanctified. So we need to be praying. It's called intercession. It's an old fancy word for praying for people. Praying that God would rescue and redeem people just like he rescued and redeemed me and you. Just like it. So prayer is one. And then the last one is going. Being sent. Actually going out. Ezekiel 36, 23 is a sister passage of Isaiah 6. It's very similar. God talks about his holiness a lot. And what he says is God's holiness is, uh, is, is sending, uh, he's gonna bring people into uh, that were far away, far away from God. God's gonna bring them back to the land. And everybody's gonna know the holiness of God. Look, God's holiness wants to send us out to let the world know how good and how perfect and how gracious he is. And that, yeah, he's separated, but that there's a way back. I think a lot of us think that for us to be holy as God is holy, we have to like separate ourselves from people. Like, oh, we can't hang around our non-Christian friends or, oh, I can't hang around with those people. They do this. Jesus tells us that it's not who we hang around with that defiles us. It's actually what comes out of our mouth. Shows what's in our heart. Holiness doesn't mean we separate ourselves from the world around us. We're not monks. My uh, commanding officer, uh, one of the last days I was in uh, at Fort Hood, gave me my first medal. It wasn't anything major, but to me it was the world. It's the first medal I ever got. And I was always kind of awkward around people of rank. I felt like I was doing something wrong. And after that, I wasn't as awkward. You know why? Because somebody that I respected, somebody of rank, told me I was doing a good job and told me I was included. And that sent me out from there. God's holiness is a big thing, something that in 30 minutes we barely touched. But God's holiness is the core of who he is. When you recoil from that and you you get nervous around that, you're scared to get to know who he really is. And yeah, he's separated from us, but not anymore because of Christ. He draws us in close. And he wants to know you and he wants to dwell with you, he wants to spend time with you. He's made a way for that to happen in Jesus Christ. And you can talk about with somebody how to do that either uh, online or you can go to the next steps room and then get ready because you're going to get sent out to proclaim his holiness to the world. And what a pleasure that is. What a gift it is. Let's pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, you are holy. And Lord, I, I, I'll be honest, I've spent the whole week studying that and I, I I'm still don't have my head around it because you are so much bigger and so much other than me. And so God, I praise you for the men and women who have come before me, who've contributed, Lord, to understanding, who've thought about you and have contributed their thoughts to understanding what it means to worship a holy God. And we stand here thousands of years later, contributing to the same discussion, the same song, the same symphony. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The earth is full of his glory. I pray that each person in this room would walk out of here with that burned and impressed on their hearts and on their lips and that this week they might be able to proclaim the holiness of their God to those around them in the world that needs to hear it. And it's in your name we pray.